Hey, Satenico here once again for God Loves Comics. And this is a little bit of an undiscovered gem from Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, The Black Dossier. And this is called The Life of Orlando based on the Virginia Woolf novel. And I'm going to read it for you. So I hope you enjoy. Chapter One, I Am Born. Gather round, kindly readers. Draw closer and I'll tell a tale like no other of loves, wars, and empires ground down unto sand. For my name is Orlando, and I have lived 3,000 years. I write this by lamplight, a young man embalmed blackout London with her Hinkle's Luftwaffe droning above. But I am neither young nor back then in 1260 BC was I born as a man. Splendid Thebes was my birthplace, fair Bronze Age Greek city-state there in Boeotia. The seven against Thebes were by then defeated, their sons yet to rise and avenge them, and all was at peace. The blind seer Tiresias, cursed to change into a woman and back, and companion to tragic Oedipus, fathered my dear sister Manto and I. She inherited his gift of prophecy, while I inherited nothing. Or so it appeared. I was named Bio then, meaning life, and age 10 that life changed when I sprouted male organs, becoming a boy. Neither father nor Manto had seen that one coming, apparently. Horrified by this reminder of his gender-changing shame, father sold me as an exotic novelty to pirate slavers bound for Egypt. Father later died, I heard, escorting Manto to become the Oracle at Delphi. What a life I led amongst those rogues tossed on the heaving breast of the Mediterranean. What things I learned of sails and knots, of how to curse and drink, and many other things besides. Being a girlish boy as had I had been a boyish girl, I learned a little how to fight and how to love, both in a rough way. My companions thought I'd fetch a pretty sum. And so I did. This was 1250 BC by the current reckoning. Since androgyny was fashionable with Egypt's ruling class, I fast became a favorite of the pharaoh Uzumatra, called by some Azamandias. Yes, you can see the pharaoh Uzumatra there with his copious man boobs and a harem of nude women, including apparently Orlando and uh, Alan Moore's Never-ending fascination with Ozymandias. He was a vain, pretentious man. Some centuries thereafter, passing through that place, I saw the great stone head men speak of. It looked nothing like him, having neither his weak chin nor his chubby jowls. Eventually aged just 19 and older than the pharaoh liked his boys, I sought out new employment. Drawing on my time amongst the pirates to enlist upon an expedition setting sail for Punt in Africa. Without a seafaring tradition of its own, Egypt depended upon foreign sailors for its expeditions, with whom I found easy berth, and soon around the Horn of Africa found much, much more continues next week because this supposedly is running in a magazine with the unfortunate or a newspaper with an unfortunate name of Trump in uh, 1953 as a weekly serial. But of course, this is all in the same edition of the Black Dossier. As you can see, Trump 29, August 1953, Chapter 2, I Become Immortal. Born a girl to gender-changed Tiresias of Thebes, become a boy aged 10 and sold into slavery to Egypt in 1240 BC, I embarked for Punt in Africa, by now a strong young man. We'd barely landed 
when this changed and I found myself female once again, nor was I some androgynous young child. Feeling unsafe amongst my lusty former crewmates, I escaped into the jungle, almost without incident. Almost. Fully grown woman now, uh, which doesn't work when you're amongst horny sailors. For weeks I wandered aimless, living off the forest, stumbling at last upon the ancient land of Kor and what is now Uganda. There, within a great sky-blasted crater, I discovered a peculiar pool. Bathing in its lapid, liquid flames, emerging strangely vitalized, I noticed old names and a map carved at its edge. I did not carve my name there till millennia later, during the upstart Aisha's rule. So you can see that she bathed in the liquid flames and that gave her immortality. The map led me to Abyssinia and a community of others who had bathed within the pool, who told me I was now immortal, as were they. Some, the oldest, had a sullen troglodyte demeanor. Spending decades amongst them, I finally detected this stagnation in myself and moved on. I'd been Mistress Bayo all this time, but it was Master Bayon that the Abyssinian chieftain Mimnon sent to defend Ilium. In Ilium, as Troy was then called, in 1184 BC, I first knew war, a conflict instigated by gods to call their hybrid byblos, the increasingly alarming, often psychologically unstable race of heroes. Those I met were pitiable or else hateful. Ajax, a confused brute. Achilles, a smug and vulnerable maniac. Odysseus, a shifty little swine. Even Aeneas, son of Aphrodite and Anchises, whom I escaped Troy with, wasn't perfect. As you can see here, um, in this panoramic panel, um, there's a sword going through what may be the mouth <laughs> of this Trojan. And there's another spear going through the throat uh, and this most likely Ajax is ripping uh, this guy's throat out with his teeth. So, and he actually has a bit of a spear in his arm, but um, indeed not the glowing image of the Greek gods and uh, their acolytes that we always are so used to in common mythology. It's more accurate actually to what Homer intended. Oh, I loved him well enough. Everyone did. Son of the love goddess. Aeneas was irresistible, breaking hearts everywhere like poor Queen Dido's. When headed for Italy after Troy's downfall, we put briefly into Carthage. Queen Dido was the queen of Carthage, uh, which of course was eventually destroyed in the Second Punic War with Rome. Cato the Elder, the Roman senator, used to end all of his speeches with Delinda S. Carthago, meaning Carthage must be destroyed. And eventually it was destroyed and the ground was sown with salt, supposedly, so nothing could grow there. Of course, that is now the location of modern Tunisia. Tragedy haunted Aeneas's family. Living with them in Italy for 80 years as loyal, ageless Bayon, I finally saw Aeneas's great-grandson Brutus banished for accidentally killing his father and elected to travel with him. In 1101 BC, anchored near Leogosia, Brutus went ashore alone save for myself. At a shrine of Diana, he dreamed the goddess told him of a northern isle where he would found a mighty nation. So it was some months thereafter 
that we reached the place of which the moon goddess had spoken. Seeing its white cliffs loom majestically ahead, I knew I'd found another home. Chapter 3, I Discover Britain Born female in 1260 BC, with my sire Tiresias' tendency for changing gender, I had emerged immortal from an African pool and fought at Troy as Bion, comrade of Aeneas. Now it was 1100 BC, and with Aeneas's great-grandson, young Brutus, I'd reached the northern island where a vision had told Brutus he would found a mighty nation. Disappointingly, it was already populated by a grotesque race of giants. These were subdued when Brutus's best wrestler threw their chieftain, a monstrosity called Gogmagog, or possibly Gogmagiot, over a cliff. Within 10 years, we had almost wiped out the entire giant race upon that rain-swept isle. Obviously, some survived, vengefully plaguing Brutain, as Brutus named the land, for centuries. By then, though, once more female and weary of Brutain's capital, New Troy, or Troy Novantum, I'd moved on for pastures greener. Named Bio again, I worked my passage east by means of prostitution and small fraud, settling here and there along the way. In 960 BC, aged 300, I reached Cathay, now called China. As a handmaiden of the great King Mu, I traveled with him unto Mount Kunlun, where lived the goddess Shui Wang Mu. Her mountain palace guarded by a human-headed tiger named Lu Wo. After the king departed, I remained, becoming lover to the royal mother of the West, as the goddess was known. She'd gained immortality by copulating 3,000 men to death, and our passions were furious. Well, that is indeed an impressive feat. This is a little Alan Moore's Lost Girls here. These tendrils emerging from her nipples and uh, doing a little bit of The Fisherman's Wife by Hoka's Eye, even though this is Chinese lore, but just the same. Gods are exhausting, even to immortals. And finally, I left, traveling back to Italy under my new Latinate name, Vita, which also means life. Unbelievably, I tarried there two centuries, time passing differently among deities. Two millennia later, I heard that the ruthless Ugandan immortal Aisha finding herself incarnated in China and lacking a power base, had somehow contrived to both kill and replace Shui Wang Mu, ruling there on the Kunlun, now called Hess or Fire Mountain, in my lover's stead. Though I confess the fact with shame, that is one fight I should have liked to witness. However, returning to my own tale. Returned to Italy in 774 BC, I found the new-built city Rome and met its founders, wolf-reared Romulus and Remus, identical twins. I slept with both accidentally, prompting Romulus to murder his brother. Hmm. Quite the troublemaker. Luckily, this tragedy coincided with fresh stirrings down below. Vita became Vito, escaping Rome unnoticed. Decades later, the scandal forgotten, I joined Queen Semiramis' Indian expedition, seeking Eastern tranquility. Continues next week. And you can see the funeral procession behind Vito now, even though 
once again, you can see a little bit of the um, stubble, a little bit of the five o'clock shadow as he's transitioned. You can see a lot of people in agony as Remus's body passes through the streets of Rome. 12 November 1953, Chapter 4, I Conquer the World. Made dual gendered and immortal by astounding quirks of fate, I was 560 years old when, in 700 BC, I enlisted in the army of Babylon's queen and founder Semiramis, then engaged in conquering India. As manly veto, veteran of Troy, I routed enemy war elephants, becoming the queen's foremost military advisor, though never her bedfellow, since she tended to execute these the following morning. Presumably, I served her better alive. Uh, yes, you definitely want to avoid her bed. Decades later, Simirami seduced her own son and successor, allegedly becoming divine upon her death. After that, I moved on, fighting for Persia against Greece at Marathon in 490 BC, afterwards wandering the region. Thus, it was in Macedonia. Around 334 BC, I met with an ambitious, somewhat mad young stable hand named Alex, whom across the next decade or so, I helped to subjugate most of the world. That would be Alexander the Great, a mad young stable hand. At sea monster plagued Alexandria in the 320s, I suggested Alexander build a bathosphere so that the creatures might be scrutinized and sketched, allowing the construction of great metal likenesses along the Alexandrian shoreline. These giant effigies scared off the monsters most effectively, whereupon Alexander claimed all credit for the scheme. The iron leviathons, much weathered, still endure today as a beachfront amusement area for tourists and their children. Obviously, it mixes actual history with myth, and this concept is actually pretty brilliant. Maybe a little bit like Easter Island as well. Maybe they were put there to ward off sea monsters or such, but um, the idea that these were placed here to ward off the sea monsters and then hundreds of years later remain as an amusement park is a pretty cool idea. Shortly after Alexander's death, I became Vita again, spending the next 250 years reading my way through the great library at Alexandria with Ptolemaic Egypt's fabulous, although incestuous culture spread around me. Mail once more, I returned to Rome in 70 BC, my fling with its founders now forgotten. Embroiled in slave revolts, I escaped punishment by simply declaring, I'm Vito, everyone else apparently being named Spartacus. That's a really funny bit right there, where, of course, famously in Spartacus, the Romans came and asked, who was Spartacus? And one by one, everyone stood up and said, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. Well, Orlando, now Vito, said, hey, I'm Vito. I'm not Spartacus. And the Romans were fine with that. Meanwhile, in the background, all the would-be Spartacuses are gruesomely crucified. So that's <laughs> dark humor at its best from Alan Moore. Finding myself in the Roman army, I accompanied Julius Caesar during 55 BC when he invaded Britain, as Brutain had become. Troy Novantum was now squalid tribal hovels, whose barbaric inhabitants successfully resisted our incursion. Eleven years thereafter, back in Rome, Caesar having been assassinated, I became a soldier of Mark Antony during his affair with the radiant, albeit pungent, Cleopatra and the pair's disastrous battle with Augustus at Actium. <laughs> I actually do have a book on Cleopatra, but I would have to read it, which I haven't done, to find out what uh, historic basis Alan Moore has for 
tossing in radiant, albeit pungent. That's pretty funny. Following Actium, I retreated into Egypt with the defeated lovers, Augustus's men in hot pursuit. Antony and Cleopatra killed themselves, their soldiers massacred when the pursuing troops arrived. Fortunately, having become female, I was spared. So the harem is all left alive. Once again, we see Orlando with a bit of stubble, but breast and always conveniently changing genders when needed. That was 30 BC. Female for barely three decades, by 1 AD as Vito, I fought Teutons on the empire's northern frontiers. Regrettably, in 1200 years, I'd become very good at war. And you see one of the Teutons being beheaded, apparently by Vito. This would be around uh, Ridley Scott's gladiator period. I believe they're fighting the Teutons. Well, they're certainly fighting Germanic barbarians. 19 September 1953, Chapter 5, I Outlive Mighty Empires. He's already outlived, or she has already outlived many. Immortal and transsexual. 1,200 years old by the first century AD, I'd seen Rome's emperors come and go. In 30 AD, slimy, child-molesting Tiberius was succeeded by the ruthless, although undeniably sane, Caligula. Wow, that's interesting. Far worse words for slimy, child-molesting Tiberius than for Caligula. Ruthless, but undeniably sane, which is not typically, I think, the historical narrative. Stuttering, skulking, Claudius followed who in 43 AD once more invaded Britain, this time successfully. Serving under him as veto, I found Britain a depressing place, transferring to Naples with Nero's secession. That's probably also a little bit of humor from Alan Moore, stating that Britain, his home country, a little bit of a depressing place. In 79 AD, I sailed from Naples with the famed scribe Pliny's expedition to Pompeii, its citizens recently killed by an eruption of volcanic gas. Fearing further outburst, I stayed aboard ship, thus narrowly escaping Pliny's fate. Shaken, I relocated to volcano-free lands near the Black Sea, where in 100 AD, I became apprentice to the great Apollonius of Tyana and then to the charlatan snake cultist, Alexander of Abonatakis. And this is the illustration of the eruption at, of Vesuvius at Pompeii. And what's interesting here is this man in the foreground in the sort of brown tunic actually looks like Siren Hines who played Caesar in the HBO series Rome. And he was also in Game of Thrones as the leader of the wildlings. Um, so it's pretty interesting because that looks like you may have used him as a, a photo reference. By 150 AD, I'd become lovely Vita once again. And after Alexander made certain advances, had defected to his rival and stern critic, the sage Lucian, with whom I journeyed accidentally to the moon, our ship transported by a monstrous water spout. Returned to this world, I endured the reign of mad Heliogabalus around 200 AD, and by 363 was greatly cheered when Emperor Julian officially declared Britain a pagan nation. Not sure what part of mythology this takes place from, where the ship was transported to the moon by a monstrous water spout. Returning there, enjoying the new myth-soaked atmosphere in 376 AD, I was seduced, embarrassingly, by a most charismatic 13-year-old boy. Irresistibly persuasive, allegedly son of the devil, his name was Ambrosius Merlinus. Merlin? In 410, Rome withdrew 
Empire collapsing while Ambrosius and I watch noble Uther's Cornish kingdom take its place. Forty years later, with Merlinius in his 80s, certain marvelous events established a new monarch named Arturus. King Arthur, and you can see the sword and the stone being withdrawn, seems to be emitting a lot of power that people are shielding their eyes from. Ah, Arthurian Britain, quite as wonderful as is supposed, and yet within two decades foundered dismally, with Merlin entombed by a sorceress, Arturus slain in a battle with his wronged child Mordred on Salisbury Plain. I knew them all, knew sweet Guinevere, half-witted Percival, knew awesome, monstrously ugly Lancelot, Male once again as Vito, I fought alongside them in that final battle from which incidentally I salvaged Arthur's sword. Just as he did with the Greek gods, you can see Alan Moore sort of debunking this modern narrative of certain figures in the sense that uh, Lancelot is monstrously ugly and Percival is half-witted. He does say Guinevere is sweet, but um, overall there's this uh, sort of bringing these uh, mythical figures back down to earth. That was 468 AD, rechristening the blade Durandal to disguise its misappropriation. I abandoned Britain to barbarism, plagued by ogres, giants, and fairies, governed by Arthur's half-sister, Dread Morgana. A dark aeon had begun. Twenty years wandering brought me to Denmark, where, as a sword for hire, I took employment with King Hrothgar of Hero, seemingly troubled by a monster which I ensured him I could handle. And that monster is likely to be Grindel in Denmark. Continues next week, or in the next couple of seconds. September 1953, September 26. Over 1,700 years old and temporarily male, 490 AD found me at Hrothgar's court in Denmark, where I encountered Grindel, a rampaging monster and thereafter Beowulf. I'm still not entirely sure what Beowulf was exactly. And we can see this is kind of amazing what um, Kevin O'Neill is able to do here. It's always hard to tell how incredibly detailed um, Alan Moore's scripts are, and even if he provides some sketches, but still we have this image of him having his arms ripped off and viscera ripped from his abdomen. And, you know, it's just this bizarre sort of amorphous figure. So Kevin O'Neill just kind of has to wing it and figure out what he's dealing with and visualize it, which he continues to do extraordinarily well throughout this entire uh, amazing tale because he has to draw so many different eras and so many different, you know, costume changes and settings and mythical heroes and villains. And so it's quite impressive that it still ably tells the story alongside with Alan Moore's words. A decade later, in 500 AD, I accompanied the hero Siegfried, who, except for being suicidally brave, had no other personality traits whatsoever, which is really funny. <laughs> That's his only personality trait. It was through him, however, that I first glimpsed higher ethereal realms. These territories that modern science might term other dimensions bordering ours, whilst strictly speaking outside time, nevertheless have histories and conflicts as tumultuous as those of the material world. In the terrestrial year 568 AD, for instance, I beheld the end of the Teutonic gods at Ragnarok. A cataclysm mirrored in the earthly realm by a collision with a weighty meteoric rock, its dust veiling the heavens for three years. And here we see another one of these panoramas uh, in which Kevin O'Neill is just <laughs> given the 
immense task of a drawing Ragnarok within one panel. So Alan Morris is like, okay, Kevin here, we're going to draw Ragnarok. Going to have someone chopping a giant's leg off, even as the giants are stepping on one of the poor souls, one of the poor Norsemen. And in the middle here, we're going to have Thor laying down Mignona on this dragon's head, giants in the distance, and a poor soul with PTSD hiding in the helmet of one of the fallen giants. Yeah, sounds like an easy task. And Kevin O'Neill pulls it off with a plum. During this endless fimble winter, when it seemed the moon had been devoured, I made for France, where in 764 AD I joined the Knights of Charlemagne under the more contemporary sounding name of Roland. So he's getting closer to becoming Orlando, he's Roland. In 778, beset by Saracens, while in the Pyrenees, veteran of Troy and Marathon, my sword Durandal flashing, I fought on when all save I were slain, and pressed, my foes eventually bade me join them. So beset by Saracens, literally the last man standing with the sword of King Arthur, renamed Durandal. He so impresses the Saracens that they allow him to just join them. And he is very good at navigating new cultures as we see. Now a Saracen with Roland mispronounced Orlando. In Baghdad, I met the Caliph Harun al-Rashid and his beguiling concubine Shaharazad. More devastatingly, I also met the love of my protected life, a mariner named Sindabad. Sind with a D, two Ds. Near 30 blissful years, we were together till he left on that eighth voyage from which he would never return. I moped almost a century in Baghdad until Harun's grandson, al wathik Bela became caliph. I roamed with Caliph Vathek, as he was more lately known, helping him build the palace al Karemi in Samara and accompanying him in his trip up the Fakrakin Valley to the hush black terraces of Ishtakar, the genie haunted catacombs beneath them. Here I witnessed Vathek bargain with the demon Eblis for a vision of hell's treasures, whereafter his heart burned eternally. This seemed unfair since frankly hell's treasures were rather suburban. More dark humor and an illustration of a man not only haunted by the demons of hell, but with an eternally burning heart. That was around 900 AD. I was still wandering the Holy Land when the Crusades began nearly two centuries later. Admiring the Crusaders' outfits, I again switched sides, fighting alongside the legendary Priester John and others. <laughs> simply because he admired their outfits and they did have really really nice outfits with those crosses and the white tunics it's really nice in the 1190s i helped blondel and his minstrel underground free richard called the lionheart from prison enjoying my new name i by then sworn to be orlando all my extraordinary days so they freed Richard the Lionheart and he officially or she officially becomes Orlando. Continues next week or within the next couple of seconds. The 3rd of October, 1953, chapter seven. I make friends easily, <laughs> indeed. And I don't. Despite surviving 2,450 years already, man and woman, sometimes I feared that those beastly middle ages simply wouldn't end. 
Even Robin Hood's merry men, encountered in 1197 on returning from the Crusades, seemed miserable. Even before I read that, I could see the panel that Robin Hood's merry men were anything but merry, except for maybe one of them. Friar Tuck, not too happy. Robin himself, absolutely miserable. Mainland Europe was no improvement. In 1307, female once again and become William Tell's assistant while he took his apple trick on tour. We were everywhere beset by dark age monsters, trolls, and dire wolves. Looks as if he was going to perform the apple trick with this fair maiden. I don't think that's Orlando, but perhaps. When, in fact, a dire wolf came... <laughs> And instead, the arrow struck the dire wolf between the eyeballs, but that doesn't seem to kill it. So, yes, the Dark Ages indeed. Culture starved by 1450 AD, I had settled in Constantinople, throne of learning, where I made my living as a dancer, studying by day. Unfortunately, only three years later, the Byzantine capital fell to the glowering Ottoman hordes of Mehmet II, ending Byzantium's empire after a mere thousand years. Along with other scholars, I fled west to Italy, taking along as many books and manuscripts as I could carry. Thus I started the Renaissance, a sublime relief after those gloomy centuries. I posed for Leonardo, even though I was becoming a man at the time. I remember he kept asking me why I was smirking. So funny. So now Orlando is the Mona Lisa, and that's why the slight smile. Leonardo da Vinci is asking her, why is she smirking? Traveling through Europe in the 1530s, Prague... I was apprenticed to the sorcerer Johannes Faust, whereby I renewed my acquaintanceship with Helen, whom I had not seen since Troy. We chatted, though this irritated Faust and Mephistopheles. Soon afterwards, the doctor was approached by a precocious 13-year-old nobleman from Italy seeking occult instruction. Faust being otherwise engaged just then, I accompanied the boy back to Milan. His name was Prospero. Faust otherwise engaged <laughs> by demons. Duke Prospero's companion during youth, I went with him in 1558 to England where he was made court astrologer to the newly crowned Gloriana, England's queen, daughter of brutal Henry VIII, and fairy half-breed Nan Boleyn. <laughs> Anne Boleyn is Nan Boleyn. Interesting. Charged by prescient Gloriana to inaugurate a mighty league after her death, Prospero resided in Mort Lake under the name Subtle with his wife Dahl Common and fellow alchemist Edward Face. Meanwhile, I languish bored in London. When his wife died, grieving Prospero took daughter Miranda to an island not to return until 1610, when he assembled Gloriana's prophecy league. This included otherworldly Christian, whom we rescued from a madhouse in 1678. And just when you think this had nothing to do with the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and that was perfectly fine because it is a rip-roaring tale nonetheless. In fact, Alan Moore incorporates a little bit of League in here after all. Over time, this group embraced such notables as beloved Spanish aristocrat Quixote, okay, impoverished sea captain Robert Oemush, and ravishing courtesan Mistress St. Clair, with Christian and deathless Prospero, flanked by his spirit creatures, we made a formidable ensemble. 
Though originally devised by Gloriana and her spy master Jack Wilton for reasons unexplained, this league in one form or another would be my companions for the next few centuries. Continues next week. 10th of October, 1953, Chapter 8, I Become Modern. Almost 3,000 years old by 1696 AD and currently a man, I'd taken up with an engaging crew of misfits as originally proposed by England's fairy monarch, Gloriana, prior to her death in 1603. I accompanied their last adventure, ferrying an ailing Prospero back to the spectral Arctic blazing world where he took leave of us forever. His last words at the brink of that shimmering mirage were, follow me. Prospero walking and right up in front of him is Hyde. Since Gloriana's death and subsequent King Jacob's vicious purges of the fairy race, enchantment had been scarce in Britain. Fairyland withdrew contact entirely in 1616, the same year that noted biographers Shakespeare and Cervantes died. That's interesting that Shakespeare and Manuel Cervantes both died in 1616. With Prospero gone and our league disbanded, England seemed dull. I roamed the world, even revisiting Kor in Africa and its magic pool, this time carving my name on the rock there beside it, Orlando. So he's come full circle. Uh, he was, I believe, a woman when he bathed in the, the liquid fire before, and now he's clearly a man. He said that he would not write his name there until a millennia later. So here we are, a thousand years later, We've come full circle and he's back in core. Returning to Britain in 1740, I found a new band of adventurers formed in my absence. This time numbering unlucky mariner Lemuel Gulliver, trapper Natty Bumpo, libertine Mistress Hill, dual-natured clergyman Dr. Sin, and the resourceful Blakeneys amongst its members down the decades. I stood by them through Brobdenog's giant wars and helped them in the subterranean adventures, finding them worthy successors to the mantle of Prospero's men. Having aided Percy Blakeney during France's revolution, Come centuries end, I frequently accompanied him, Marguerite, and Fanny on the trio's annual sojourns through erotic Europe, with our weeks spent in Twilight Horselberg being most memorable. Uh, again, a little, little bit of Lost Girls going on there. With the remarkably elderly Gulliver's demise in 1799, the League once more disintegrated. I spent much of the 19th century in France as companion to either superhuman esthete Fortunio or ambiguous Mademoiselle de Maupin. Well, this is a gruesome panel. 1906 found me female traveling in Tibet where, at the monastery So Saling, I was captured by Bon sorcerers, who used me dreadfully, but didn't make me into ointment, as they did young men. Wow. Once again, fortunately female, so they obviously raped and molested her at the monastery, reminded, but Meanwhile, there were boiling young men down into ointment. Ghastly. Escaping, I reached the Azure Mount Karakal and Dragon Blazon Shangri-La, where I was learning yoga from a willing lama when interrupted by an English couple who were undertaking expeditions in the area. This, <laughs> another funny panel. 
uh, yoga from a willing llama. Yes, very willing, I'm sure. And she's completely nude in this uh, interesting yoga pose where his feet seem to be doing quite a bit of walking across her rear end. The pair, Alan and Wilhelmina, turned out to be agents of the English crown affiliated to the latest incarnation of the cabal previously led by Prospero and Gulliver. That would be the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I believe. It transpired we had much in common, and they were the most delicious company as we returned to England via the North Pole having many grand adventures on the way. I was finding this modern world most agreeably entertaining. Concludes next week. One more. Really fascinating. Here's a polar bear and here is a sperm whale frozen in a glacier. Quite an image. Chapter nine, I conclude my account on the 17th of October, 1953. Ancient and of varying gender, I contributed enthusiastically to Wilhelmina's 20th century team. In 1910, male again, I strived alongside her, Alan, the thief Raffles, and occultist Karnacki to avert disaster at King George's coronation. In 1913, assisting the team against French counterparts, Léon Mistero, I nearly died battling the albino Zenith and pounding rain atop the Paris Opera. Clearly, this new century was as dangerous as any other. Even things Alan Moore just tosses aside would probably make entire comic series for other writers. Uh, nearly died battling the albino zenith and pounding rain atop the Paris Opera. Worth noting in this previous panel that King George's coronation, which from which they averted disaster, and this pile of heads, which again, Kevin O'Neill has taken pains to make each face distinctive. It was certainly as warlike. Having some military experience, I fought for Britain in World War I, as did my colleague, penitent bandit A.J. Raffles, who would lose his life during the conflict. At the Battle of Mons, I was lucky enough to see Agincourt's phantom bowman aiding the English. One ghost claimed to recognize me, though I don't think I was even at Agincourt. Who knows? Perhaps I was. Quite bizarre. Uh, the Phantom Bowman, and you can see one ghost stopping to say, hey, do I recognize you? And the other British soldiers are looking over, amazed that you're speaking to the Phantom Bowman. It's going to almost be um, a Jacques Tardy panel. After the war, I'm afraid I spent the 1920s enjoying myself. Yes, the Roaring Twenties. I belonged to the poor Agatha Runcible set. We knew the Woosters, the Claytons, Jay and Daisy, absolutely everyone. It was all such smashing fun. Jay and Daisy uh, sounds like uh, The Great Gatsby, aligns right up with the 1920s. The 1930s, less so. Yeah, the 1930s would be the Depression era. Throughout the decade, one could feel storm clouds gathering. With Mina, Alan, and other new friends, I revisited the blazing world and the polar waste beyond where we made some important allies. That would be Mina Harkness and Alan Quatermain. By 1939, of course, the dictator Adenoid Hinkle had dragged the world into a new and even more destructive war. Keen to keep abreast of changing times, I mastered aeronautics and enlisted in the Royal Air Force, flying with aces such as Bigglesworth, Hebblethwaite, and visiting Yank G8 
who seemed frankly bonkers. Shot down over France, I escaped back to Blighty to find my comrades missing in action, their headquarters deserted. So the important allies, one would assume is actually kind of a funny joke that they would actually become part of the allied forces in World War II. And also funny that he would mention the flying aces, but when he gets to yank G8, he seemed frankly bonkers. So that is the American. Got to get an American jab in there at some point, right? You're not European or British if you don't attack the Americans at some point. Now it is 1943. My tale is almost over while outside the air raid continues. I know that Alan and Mina are alive somewhere and expect that I shall see them sooner or later. As for myself, I was 3,203 years old last week and I endure. I saw London founded, hewn by Trojan blades, and now I see it flattened by German incendiary devices. I've witnessed cities beaten to their knees, fought all of our pointless wars, seen millions slaughtered, peerless cultures smudged by history's thumb, and all things considered wouldn't change a moment. I was Bio, I was Vita, and where human life went, there went I. It was a very great adventure, and I am proud to have been a man, to have been a woman, to have been Orlando. The end as Orlando, as a wine-holding aristocrat, looks out at London burning to the fire bombings, even though it didn't describe him as Hitler, instead as Adenoid Hinkle, but close enough. So that's it. That's the end of the tale of Orlando. I think it's an amazing piece of work um, that somehow Alan Moore was able to work into the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen tangentially, touching on a lot of the things that Alan Moore has always been interested in in his work. and. It is beautifully rendered and illustrated by Kevin O'Neill. For any other writer, certainly within the comics medium, it would be their masterpiece. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed reading this. Uh, I feel like I'm running out of stuff to read by Alan Moore, but I'm happy to have uncovered this uh, gem that I very much enjoyed reading. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. And thanks very much for listening. And please remember to like and comment and subscribe. Uh, that way I'm motivated to do more. I have plenty of more things planned, but uh, thanks very much once again. And see you next time on God Loves Comics.